So my next guest is a member of the Broadcasters Hall of Fame on his team class, Music and Entertainers Hall of Fame as well. He's the owner of Star Worldwide Networks, one of the fastest growing internet radio and TV networks in the nation. My guest is also a media consultant for Tribune Media Group with over 40 television stations in America, including Chicago's very own 720 WGN Radio in Chicago. I'm here with the morning mayor, Dave Pratt. Dave, welcome. Ah, oh, well, thank you. And thanks for having me. Uh, together, we are lean, mean, quarantine machines. <laughs> and yeah, and the Tribune, by the way, just to, just to be clear on that, I loved consulting with the Tribune. But a few months ago, uh, our group sold to Nexstar for $6.4 billion, something oh. small like that. So yeah, we did have uh, WGN and KTLA in Los Angeles and WPIX in New York and legendary stations all over the nation. And I loved working with Tribune and I loved consulting them. It was an honor, but that did flip over to Nexstar, yeah, 6.4 billion. You know, it's a little hard to keep up with all this stuff going on. Just honest with radio, I mean, it's always a surprise. When you see stations that are getting bought off and companies that are actually kind of increasing up as opposed to those that are being held, you know, hostage by private equity groups, you know? You know, when that went to uh when that went to Nextstar, they, they were so kind to me and, and and on both sides of the companies uh doing the transaction, they were both overly kind to me. But when it went to Nextstar, they said, So so Dave, you know, are, are you still interested? And I said, Well, guys, you're you're talking about moving from 40 stations to what 200 and some it's uh the the job's different and in the meantime i'm still running this network back in arizona so i don't know if i can take off that big a bite of the apple but uh but i sure appreciated it now real quick i'm just just to put this together were you uh did you ever get to work or rub shoulders uh work wise with kim commando Oh, of course. In fact, Kim and her husband, Barry, a lot of people don't realize this, but her husband, Barry, was one of the highest profile personalities in the history of Arizona. Incredibly entertaining guy, funny, one of my all-time favorite radio personalities, uh, Barry Young. And Kim, his wife, developed this wonderful network on her own, and our kids went to school together. <laughs> wow. So I've uh, been friends with them forever. In fact, her husband, Barry, when, so I, I started out as a media war horse here before doing the network and before yeah. starting our own company as an agency. Barry and I were so obnoxious on telethons, they would actually separate us like fifth graders. <laughs> they, they wouldn't let us, they wouldn't let us be on camera together. They'd separate us and he would be in Studio A, and I would be in Studio B because we weren't allowed to hang out together on telephones. <laughs> you know, I, I, I the thing is, where you are in Phoenix, there is a well. First of all, number one, that market has some great talent, and that has has had some great radio for a long time over there. And honestly, I can go back and listen. You know, for Kim Commando for what twenty plus years. America's digital goddess. I used to remember that's a staple on weekends on any, any radio station that matters basically is that right there. Yeah. Kim is so good. And the data doctors uh, also a national show that concentrates on digital also from Arizona with Ken. Uh, so yeah, we're proud of that. And Hey, you're in a great area too. South Florida has produced some unbelievable radio over the years. So you and I are both blessed. Oh my God. I mean, if I had to name the names I had here, well, it, right off the bat, I mean, whew, from Rick Shaw to Neil Rogers to Sonny Fox to, oh, man. No, there was there was a time we just had some fantastic radio here. I mean, just for a lot of different Larry areas. King. Larry King, Bubba. Yes. I mean, South Florida, unbelievable. Yeah. No, no. We, it, it was a, a lot of places like that. Like, I'll, I'll go to Air Checks and I'll listen to some things over there, which I don't think I, could, I found any of your Air Checks out there. I was trying to look for some. It was a little hard to go ahead and find. But um, I must say, in those days that you came on the air, so let me just go and get a little bit of the background into your uh, radio career prior to the network here. You spent 30 years at Phoenix's KUPD, which is a Albert oriented rock station, real heritage rock station, if you will. Two decades as a morning mayor, as declared by the Arizona Attorney General, and even KUPD at the time when you were there, it was praised as America's uh, the American top, top America's top rock station. And 
first of all, before you came into the business, I mean, I'm looking, I'm listening, I remember listening to a book on Audible, the book from Richard Neer about FM. So mm -hmm. the story of all the progressive rock stations that came together prior to, so, you know, the Tom Donahoe's and the, you know, the Scott Muse yeah. and all these people that were all beforehand. Talk to me about yeah. the rock, the rock radio market. Cause at that point, consultants like Lee Abrams and others started to infiltrate right there in 1980 when you showed up. Talk about the <laughs> state of the market at that point. Yeah. So um, as, as far as air checks and, and stuff like that, I'm, I'm a little bit different than most radio personalities to where I've never considered radio to be the highlight of my career, although I've enjoyed it so much and I'm so grateful for it and the living that it's giving my family still is, yeah. is always highly appreciated, but I've never considered it as the high point of my career. Therefore, I have never saved an air check. I don't have one air check on my show. Wow. I've never posted an air check. Uh, I don't save any awards at all. Uh, when I typically over the years, when I received an award, we would have a funny show to where I would give the award to one of my listeners. And wow. even when I would win an award, even the national awards, I would choose a listener to go with me and they would accept it on my behalf. Cause I never really cared um, about that stuff too much. Um, I was more into the art form and more into entertaining than I was nostalgia. But then, I don't know, about two, probably 2005 or something, uh, they were going to put me into the, the Hall of Fame. And they said, Dave, we, we, don't, we don't have anything. We don't have any photos. We have a ton of stories. We, we know you want a ton of all this stuff. They said, would you do something? And I said, sure, I'll write a book. So I did. Right. And it's, it's all in the book and I donated it all to charity and that book will be refreshed on May 11th and it will come out as an audio book, uh, chapter by chapter starting May 11th with an update on it. And it has all the stories in there that you're talking about, all the programmers, all the research people that I worked with early stuff like auditioning at MTV, hosting us festivals in San Bernardino. It has all those stories in there. Now, I want to bring up the so, book in a little bit. The book, by the way, if you're looking for right now is behind the mic, 30 years of radio. And like you said, updated it so far and you're creating an auto, uh, audio book version for it. So I want to bring that up in a few minutes, but I want to just get back to the original point. I want to take out of this is that regardless of, you know, the way you might perceive, your career behind the mic. Most importantly, I mean, it is the crux of what brought you to where you are now. I mean, because, you know, the reputation comes with it. There's something to be said. I want to take this to a higher level. 30,000 okay. above feet conversation because of the fact that I look at the people that hosted radio to become something more. When I look at every damn game show host I've seen out there, they all have radio experience. So your best MCs <laughs> all have radio experience and they don't even bother yeah. to put people in front of the Oscars, the Academy Awards, the, uh, the Emmys for whatever reason, you don't see being people being placed as MCs like that. They're taking some people, some people from other areas, but for the most part, they were radio people, all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, all, even actors and, and people that we know, I mean, going back, you know, Bob Crane, Hogan's Heroes. Yeah. A uh, radio personality from Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, radio personalities first, and then they morphed into other types of media. Because that theater of the mind, something to be said about what you're able to go and do after all that sudden. Gene Shepard, always think about from WOR back in the day. Always, that was an amazing story about him. About, you know, he's brought the children, a Christmas story. And the movies making royalties over royalties <laughs> every year, uh, but that I love. And the thing is, I love gimmicks like that. His was, uh, you know, you know about that one about how he would tell people, if you're listening at night, turn your porch light on and keep it on all night. Mm -hmm. I thought that was fantastic. Little things like that were <laughs> always like the, the cues. But it's like you know what to do to engage your audience, and no matter what you do after that, you're always going to have the, the ire of people because you're going to say, okay, what's the next thing this person's going to do? That's when I feel like you have that same direction. Yeah, in this town, and we've been proud of that, it definitely had a, a stamp on this town. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, I always went by the mayor uh, yeah. because it's, it's a longer story, but I've always gone by the mayor. And still today, when I go out around town, more people call me the mayor than they do Dave. 
in Arizona. Everybody calls me the mayor. When my daughter was in kindergarten, her teacher was so disappointed because she had told her uh, that the mayor was going to come and talk to the class. And when I got there, the teacher's like, you're not the mayor, you're, you're a radio guy. I'm like, everybody calls me the mayor. The other thing, uh, Stamp, that I think it's really put on Arizona is one of the big sayings that I did over the years, and it was real simple. I would say to the crowd, <laughs> if you don't deserve it, and the crowd would chant back, who does? And I would bring on major concerts in Arizona over the years, from U2 Rattle and Hum to the Who at Sun Devil Stadium to Springsteen Born in the USA to uh, the first Def Leppard tour to, I mean, you, you name it, right? All these concerts that I introduced over the years, I would end by saying, all right, so get ready for Motley Crue because if you don't deserve it, and the crowd would just blow dry your hair. Who does? And it was so loud that all of these groups would say, Dave, Dave what was that thing you said? What, how do I get the crowd to do that? And it was so funny teaching like lead singers of the Scorpions or teaching Tim McGraw <laughs> in later in my country days how to do this. And then when they would get the reaction, they'd look over the side of the stage and smile and they'd be so excited because they found a way to engage with the crowd. Uh, and it, it was just kind of a magical little saying. Well, even today, although they, they don't say my name with it, sometimes there'll be a sporting event in town or a Fiesta Bowl or a big event in town. Yeah. Uh, at the Fiesta Bowl parade, they said, you know, here comes the – University of Ohio State, you know, marching band, the Ohio State Buckeyes marching band. Let's hear it for them if they don't deserve it. And then everybody else, who does? <laughs> that all started with my culture on the radio. And people that's still nice. use that. And that's what I'm talking all about. All the time. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. You were, so what you were to Phoenix is what Bill Graham was to San Francisco, basically. Well, I would never even put <laughs> myself in the same breath with though. Bill Graham. Hey, but, if you're putting that um, kind of thank uh, you. Co companies, not that bad. Come on now. Oh, um, man, I'll take that all day long, but, <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. And I've just been really lucky to spend my entire career in the same city. I never wanted to leave. I did for a blink, uh, and I came back within two weeks because I missed Phoenix so much. Uh, and all that's documented in the book. Um, been lucky to have offers from every city you can possibly imagine and MTV and everybody else. And I never jumped because I just, I love this city and I always wanted to be that guy that's aligned with a city and been able to see Phoenix grow. Keep in mind when it is a big I thing started to here and from another market, try to move over just some of that has just not worked. I mean, we've, you, when you were embedded in some place for so long and, and people were familiar, you know, it's, it's just too bad that we just don't see that much where these days, it, I don't know if it makes much of a difference, but in the time you were doing the radio for the last, for three decades up into the two thousands, you know, it's just everything that's changed the way radio is. So it just matter. It's just now survival. It's not even, there's a choice anymore as a, as a top radio personality. There's just nothing there. Um, unless People, you get syndicated, I guess. The, the industry's changed. So much and so many great personalities have come through Phoenix. The original owner of KUPD, the station where I started, said, Dave, I'll give you a contract if you can beat Jonathan Brandmeier. Oh. <laughs> and I said, I remember wow. you went there. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, WLS uh, fame. Who, uh, uh, WLUP what? in Chicago. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The loop. That's right. I was thinking like Larry so, Lujak and all that stuff. But yeah, you're right. He was WLUP. here. He was here just before it. The owner said, and he was huge here. And I was a young guy. I was 19, just getting my teeth cut on a low-rated rock station at the time out of a trailer in the <laughs> middle of Guadalupe, Arizona. It was one of the lowest-rated stations in the market when I started on it. And the owner said, he kind of laughed, and he goes, if you can beat Jonathan Brandmeier, I'll give you a contract. Wow. And about halfway through my first ratings book, thank God Johnny took an offer to Chicago and I laugh about it today. So I only competed against him for a half book. So we beat him that book, right? Nice. Because, because he wasn't there though. If he would have been there, there's, I have no doubt that, that he would have won that book. 
Oh. So I joked with him later on about it. I said, thank you so much for leaving Phoenix and opening the door. <laughs> and he said, no, you were up and coming. And it's just really been a, a pleasure over the years. What you're talking about with radio changing so much, and today it's really nothing. That is so true. Part of it is because radio programming, entertainment, and talent has gone down so far because it's just not the place to be anymore. Nobody wants to go. But a bigger right. part of it is tech technology. So my kids, and they, they aren't young. My oldest is 26. Wow. I would imagine that he can't even name a radio station. Uh, I doubt if any of my kids can even. Oh, it's name. hard to turn it on now. I, I don't myself, think they can I even know name I can't one. Turn it on that much anymore. So when you and I were really, you know, cutting our chops in radio and loving it and listening to it, we had our favorite stations. We may have had a T-shirt, a bumper sticker, or whatever we had. We a, a personality would go out and do an appearance on the corner, and we'd show up to take a photo with them and say hello. Anymore, the younger generation. I challenge them to even name a station. They just oh. don't care. But as a radio fan and as a person that got to work in radio, that has worked in radio now, I, I took it for granted how good it was. And, you know, it's, it, it's obviously there's an involvement where, where that audience has gone. So there are places to be entertained, but it's just the format's changed. The technology disruption has changed every format there is of media. Music, movies, TV, and radio have come in completely disrupted from the internet and now we're getting just to a where the technology's gotten so well the bandwidth has gotten so easy to put up whatever you want now it's just grown so much uh, let me go ask you a few more questions about music and radio in general just want to get through those real quick so now you did make the switch over to a cross down station you got to work with cbs radio for a while after you left kpd and they offered you a lot of money to stay but you went ahead and go, went along you went on a station where Howard was on. So obviously if Howard's on that station, you were going to be okay at KZOM. You know, this gun hat at that time, he was obviously still like super hot. And at that point, I right in around the two thousands. And this is what always bothers me right now that rock, the whole rock is dead argument. Rock radio faded. And you smartly moved into country after that KMLE, which is run the same cluster, which was a good thing. Now you saw the running of the wall. You saw rock changing. They always talk about Woodstock 99 as being one of the major factors, but more than that, what is it now that, I mean, I'm not, I'm right now I'm almost about the fact you got to hear things with instruments and not digital. Talk to me about the fact that <laughs> when you switched over to country, you still get to hear what's kind of what rock was. It's like, you're still here people with instruments and it's like this guitar and it's drums and it's like not anymore. And, and like yeah. alternative rock is so different now. It's not even what it is supposed to be anymore. So when that transition happened, I was at KUPD for 20 years and they had changed ownership. They went to a corporate ownership yep. and rock was changing for KUPD to these alternative bands instead of being fun and exciting and having a smile on their face and really enjoying the, the ride. You got a bunch of angry alternative people staring at their tennis shoes on stage, depressed, wearing a plaid shirt. It didn't do anything for me. It, it didn't resonate with me. Yeah. And at the same time, this corporate vanilla homogenized ownership was coming in to KUPD. So I told him, I said, guys, I'm going to find something else to do. Now, this is before I even had another job. I just said, guys, I'm, I'm out. And they said, well, where are you going? Somebody else making the offer. And I said, no, I just don't want to be here. I don't want to be with you. Um, and, but I appreciate my time here, but I have no interest in this culture. So they were pretty shocked and they said, well, write out the six months of your contract. And I said, of course, I've never walked on a contract in my life, never will. Yeah. During that time, once I made it known that I was going to leave KUPD, we were blessed to have many offers in town from talk radio to country to rock or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And this uh, rock station in town that was nowhere at the time, Howard was not on it, by the way, Oh. Uh, okay. made me an offer at CBS. They said, Dave, would you come over? I said, sure. And they said, that's it. We're not going to talk money or anything. I said, I'll show you what KUPD offered. You, you match it and I'm there. And they said, that's it. And I wow. said, yep. <laughs> so I took them the offer from KUPD and I said, here it is, match it, throw some appearances and endorsements on top. And I'm there. We're, we're done. We're down the road. They said, that's it. No agent, nothing. I said, no, that's wow. it. So I went over and then CBS contacted me about a month later. Timing is everything. 
Uh And I'll keep this short for you. But they said, Dave, Howard is a CBS personality. You are now a CBS personality. Howard's contract is up for the other little station in Phoenix that he was on. And we need to put him on in Phoenix, Arizona. And I said, okay. And they said, we only have three stations in Phoenix. We have an oldie station. We have a country station and we have a rock station. So we need to put Howard on the rock station. Yeah. I said, that's fine guys, but I own that monopoly square. You want to put Howard on boardwalk or park place. Sorry. I've already got my Pratt hotel on it. You've already guaranteed me that space for the next five years. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. And so they said, so if we want Howard on, we have to go through you. And I said, absolutely. I'm the toll bridge. So if you want Howard on, not only do you have to pay me for a different shift, you need to pay me to put Howard on. So it was a really nice position to be in, but as a personality away from business, so that's business and we all do business. That's just flat business, but away from business, I looked at it and I went, okay, you're going to have Howard and Pratt on the same station in Phoenix? No brainer. (laughs) So I moved, put, I let him pay the toll bridge, put Howard on mornings. And then I immediately went on afternoons and for a short period of time when they could afford both of us, it's the highest listened to rock station in the history of Phoenix ever. Boom. (laughs) Three months out, we just annihilated the entire city. Oh my God. Annihilated it. Wow. So about a year and a half goes down the road and I got bored and I told CBS, I said, I need a new challenge. I said, this is just, I don't want this to sound elitist, but it's too easy. In the afternoon drive, did you kind of get to keep the morning format or did they really like cut your talk time? Oh yeah. No, I did anything I wanted to do. That's great. Okay. I was having a ball and I got to tell you, Howard was awesome. And his crew and his staff would come in town and screw around with me and we'd do shows and live shows and Howard's on the air calling me a brother and I'm on the air and this is a guy I used to compete with. Right. And I'm on the air having a blast with his staff. They could not have been more generous and and nicer. We we had a ball and we just kicked butt together. Well, anyway, uh, about a year and a half, I got bored. And I said, I need new challenge. CBS came to me and they said, Dave, our country station's dying. And they kind of laughed. And I said, great, I'll do it. And they go, yeah, right. And I said, no, guys, I'll do it. They said, you'll do what? I said, I'll do mornings. They said, there's no way, Dave. A 30-year rock guy in this town going mornings? Are you kidding? And I said, look, and this is what you were referring to a few minutes ago. I said, look, guys, country is the new rock. And they said, what do you mean? Yeah. I said, do you have Garth Brook flying over stadiums in harnesses? You have the (laughs) hottest women now in the music industry (laughs) as the poster girls in rock with Faith Hill and Shania Twain. You have pyro coming from Kenny Chesney and these shows that's bigger than Kiss. Yeah. You have the new rock and country and you don't even realize it. I said, look at Nashville right now. Kid rock is there, Yeah. right? Kid rock had a number one song in country. I think it was number one with Cheryl Crow called picture. Oh, Bon yeah. Jovi had a number one song. Who says you can't go home with Jennifer <laughs> Nettles from Sugarland right. <laughs> at the time. ZZ top was in Nashville, hanging out with Brooks and Dunn. Metallica's on the CMA awards. I mean, what is going on? Everybody's, in Nashville, if Leonard Skinner came out today, they would be country. Yes, I agree. I agree. So I fit right in. I go to Nashville for my first visit. Brett Michaels is there. <laughs> All right. I'm looking around going, what is, this is old home week. <laughs> and I never felt better. And before you knew it, um, we were nominated for CMA, uh, Major Market Morning Show of the Year at Madison Square Garden, New York. And I'm like, this is hilarious. That's awesome. A rock personality that moved over. So I really enjoyed all that. I loved, I love being a disruptor. I still love it. No, no, no. That's, no, that's the way it be. It's the people that buck the system. That's why I always like Howard for the mm-hmm. long, longest time. And I think I, I, I don't feel the same way about him now. When he, like he, for a little while after he got into serious, but then when it's like, okay, the fight's over, no more fights with Tom Chiasano. I'm like, you know what? 
I wish he would have stayed and kept the fight in corporate radio because that, that's what really, I think one, he's one of the things that really brought it all down. Because the problem is there's only so many people of the old guard that are around today that kept fighting to kind of like keep bucking the system because corporate radio, when they go ahead and get to succumb their vir- no, virus, basically to everything else, it just homogenizes everything. So now who's left are people that are just prop- propped up that really don't have any personality or anything else to give with it. And that's what I, that's what pisses me off. Uh, you know, it, it, that's what happened. People just said, okay, I'm going to just bail out. I'm just tapping out. It's done. I can't, I don't want to fight anymore. And, you know, it's because everybody's gotten a little bit older. They can't just keep going after it and just fighting with it, you know. And sure, I mean, some of these companies will go and command money, uh, but, you know, it's like people are going to the graves with it. It's like there's not much else left. It's like, you, you know, in 2008, out. when CBS, um, two, two things happened in 2008. And one is a little bit stealth that people don't realize. Everybody remembers the economy took a hard dive in 2008 Yep. and a lot of radio companies use that as an excuse to divest. That's when a lot of radio companies use that as an excuse to get rid of their higher paid employees to do this, make moves, whatever it is. But what was really happening was that's when radio really started to take a hard, hard dive big time. Yep. So those two things created the perfect storm. And CBS had come to me that year and they said, Dave, would you be interested in deferring? And I said, you mean like a, like an athlete defers a salary or something like that? And they <laughs> said, would you be interested in working with us? And I said, well, why would I? I'm, I'm guaranteed long term, you know? So next thing I know, um, I get my papers from CBS and this is what sucks about corporate radio. Phoenix wasn't the highest on their radar. Corporate radio concentrates on New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Dallas, San Francisco, on and on and on. And Phoenix is down the charts. Well, here I was in Phoenix doing the same type of salary. And CBS didn't even pay attention. They just did a cut across the board of personalities that were doing seven digits or whatever. And I was on there. So I reminded them, after they gave me my papers, you'll laugh at this. After they gave me my papers, I said, um, you guys realize the amount of time I have left on my contract, guaranteed appearances, endorsements, you're going to be paying me more off the air than you would be paying me on the air. Jeez. And they said, oh, God, oh, my God, did we do that? And I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, and we want, they said, so would you reconsider? I said, no, 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 no. You know, I'm thinking Tom like has got that same deal. Cause remember they cut him out of KLSX and he's like, Oh, I'll ride my deal. And he prompted to put up his own network. There you go. <laughs> Tom's a friend. He's so awesome. He's so funny. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, that, that was the deal. And you know what I did is the ultimate revenge is the next two years I had fully paid. I used, to create what we have now that's it. in the digital right. broadcast network. That's what I use the money for. And that's what I use the time to do is to create the next step being the disruptor that you were talking about. And, exactly. and I'm proud to do that. I'm having more fun today than ever. And, you know, and that's, and this is the thing where it's, um, because of the this model that you've created, I want to, I'm going to go and delve into that, but I want to go and take a minute to talk about the book again. Behind the mic, thirty years in radio. Uh, again, you gonna you have an update to it. Create an audiobook version. So I'm gonna ask you about this now, the transition, because you were only in your mid forties by this point. You were not. You were far mm-hmm. from being done. Proceeds of the book benefited the American Cancer Society, and at, you can be, and also make mention you were successfully treated for prostate cancer in 2005. You'd done a lot in mm-hmm. your career. Had been through a lot, and then you decided to get out of the grueling morning schedule you decided to go ahead and go on with a grueling morning schedule in syndication. Talk to me about that transition there where you like, okay, taking that next step, stepping out of the terrestrial spotlight and then just moving along and, and going into the satellite and just beaming yourself out and then going into online. Yeah. So what surprised a lot of people during that time isn't the fact that I started a digital network. A lot of people were 
kind of having some fun on the internet. Some were taking it serious, not many. You know, we're talking over a decade ago. Yep. It was kind of the new shiny toy, but few people were really trying to monetize off stuff like podcasts and video casts. And what really surprised people isn't the fact that I did that. It was more of the opportunity cost that I was passing up. So once that two years ended with CBS, as you can imagine, just from being around the city a long time, we had a lot of offers to do. When I say we, I mean my team. Um, we had a lot of offers to do everything from talk radio to rock radio to country radio. I mean, the phone was ringing pretty hot. Um, morning shows, television morning shows saying, Dave, you got complete freedom. You can come here and do whatever you want, you know, give this a go. And I turned all of those down in order to start my own thing. And that's what people were amazed about. Not that I started my own thing, but that I turned down the guaranteed money to do it. Because there so were two really directions was. to go. There was two directions to go. The writing on the wall you saw. Either you saw the writing on the wall that says, you know what, get out and do it and, and you know, become self, self your own business or fight and claw and scrap away every opportunity you have until it all uh, it all uh, dries up. I think above the Love yeah. Sponge, he's been hit with lawsuits. He's been had a lot of issues that had with his stations, and then just kept going down and down. And just it's it's been a it's been bad, sad to see him go where he is now. He's now on a station like I think it's on an FM translator, but really it's gone so to the spot. I mean, he still has some of an audience. I think of other people that have had a bit of an audience that you know they'll go to the point where they'll just go ahead and well I'll broker time. I'll get all these different sponsors of the past to keep propping me up and I'll just make a little bit of scratch and that's it. But either you do that or you do take the running on the wall. You say, you know what? Okay. I'm going to get out of this. You know, I don't need to go ahead and stretch myself farther than I already have what I did for all this time. I could take myself to a new venture. That's what you did. That's what Tom Likas did. That's what others did. Very few. Yeah, and keep in mind, I've always been kind of bucking the system my entire career uh, there have been articles and they cleverly call them David versus Goliath right. because I've always taken on the big guy. When I started at KUPD and I took that little tiny station in a trailer to rock station of the year, that was David versus Goliath. And then yeah. later on when I, the, we could beat my former station in three months, <laughs> same story. And then when I proved that we could have the same success in country, same story, bucking the system, winning, bucking the system, winning. And then when I started the digital side, that one really threw people for a loop because of the opportunity cost, but also because my peers in radio went, oh, God. Yep. Oh, really? If Dave's going to do this, what's going to happen? And it's so many times my peers would call up and they would say, Dave, I need your advice, man. I'm under contract and my contract's coming up. What should I do? Should I resign? And I don't know how, but I became this go-to guy for them wanting to know about the next step in their career. The problem is I would be honest with them. I would say, guys, <laughs> there is another step in your career, but nobody's going to give you a binky with a two-week paycheck. <laughs> you got to earn it. You right. got to earn it. Your show has to be good enough away from the music. You're not just spinning songs and doing weather and time and temperature, whatever. Yeah. You have to have something that people are going to buy and you have to be able to sell it. And that would scare the hell out of them. And they'd be like, Oh, you mean I don't get a two week paycheck? I'm like, guys, you're going to fly on your own. Yeah. If you really want to be a personality and you're really good away from the music and away from the comfort of that little radio station you're on, this is the time to prove that you got it. And a lot of them just, they didn't want to take that chance. Well, you can imagine the next call I would get from them is I got fired. Yeah. They aren't going to resign me. Or the more common call I would get is Dave, they told me I would stay, but I have to, take a big pay cut. And I'd be like, you control your own destiny. It's whatever you want to do. So not everybody could do it because they didn't, they didn't have the guts. They didn't have the backbone and they felt like they couldn't sell. 
selling I know isn't exciting to people. It's not glorious. It's not oh, sexy. Yeah. You gotta sell. You yeah. gotta sell. And well, that's and the point is it, it, again, it, it's you have to add tools to your tool belt. You have to learn new skills. You, you cannot just have the skill of of the gift of gab anymore. You gotta have so much more. You gotta have social media savvy. You gotta have marketing savvy. You gotta have yep. sales savvy, persuasive. I mean, you have to have all that because I mean, nobody can sell your product like you can. And that's what happened. And that's how we grew into this full agency. So the podcast side and the network side that you've been so generous to, to explain, uh, we're, we're proud of that. But the bigger side of our revenue is the full agency side. And the way that happened is exactly what you're talking about. Uh, podcast hosts would come on with us and they would eventually say, Dave, we love the way you guys are cooking the food. We only wish that you did and then fill in the blank. Social networks, yeah. video, commercials. And I kept referring others to this business. And after a while I said, screw that. Okay, we'll do that. Yep. And today that's the bigger part of our revenue to where we do commercial production for Arizona Diamondbacks, Phoenix Suns, other NBA teams, national concerts, national casinos, national amusement parks out of Phoenix. Yeah. And we do all those commercials. So even for those still listening to radio, the commercials they're hearing are being produced by a digital network in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, <laughs> Which is, I, go ahead. It's just pretty funny. And then a lot of the personalities on radio – Radio companies and television companies would contact me and they'd say, Dave, do you do personal consultation to where you would just do a one-on-one -on -one with our personalities and talk to them about typical stuff that you know about, yeah. you know, crutches in their speech. Are they looking one way more than another on camera? Can they do an interview? Do they know how to do an interview? Uh, this type of stuff. And I started doing consultation now today our agency does everything from media buying to PR. It's a one-stop shop. So either local companies or national companies can come to us and say, we need this. Okay. We got your flavor of ice cream. We're like Baskin Robbins now. Now I want to get into the business model. So mm -hmm. just to give you my background, just, so you know, well, first of all, let me go and mention Star Worldwide Networks, what it does. It offers hundreds of worldwide radio and TV shows, general advertising, media buying, all digital services, audio and video commercial production, content for social networks, et cetera. Now, what I do for full time, I run uh, for a company that's a mom and pop. That's uh, two online radio podcast networks. One is webmasterradio.fm. That's been going on since 2004. I joined the company August 1st, 2005. We do podcast production. We are, we originally were streaming radio first. And then the podcasting, the on-demand model really came across because we were doing before iPods, right? And then uh -huh. 2006, 2007, it became more podcast first, more podcast prominent. And we've really gone into that. And that's our service model there. But the other thing too that also changed for us was we would sell advertising. We would do all original programming on our end. Also the advertising the same way, but our business model changed. We were trying to offer programming time, but then we said, no, 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 fuck this. We're going to do podcasts. We're going to sell people their own podcasts and <laughs> not just an infomercial. We're going to make them, we're going to craft them into a custom made show that works for us, but then also props them up in the best possible way. And that is where we make, we, we do very well with that's our model. So the difference is we're doing it for a worldwide audience, but you have been able to hyper target Phoenix, Arizona, that's your, your bread and butter. The programming really, I've seen, it also has more of a live radio model, less than that of a podcast from what I've seen. There's projects I've seen where people have taken the money that they've gotten for terrestrial and moved into other projects. So there's uh, LA Talk Live, I've seen that has a model like that's very hyper-targeted. SoFlow Radio Miami, that was based on the producer from the Rogers Show. He decided to go and prop that up. Uh, Tom Michaels' New Normal, also kind of like, kind of like that idea. There's still, I mean, obviously they know of the audience that's out there, but it's still, it's kind of hyper-focused on where you're from. So talk to me about this micro-targeted online radio approach that you've been, that's been your go-to this whole time. Yeah. So number one, I love what you're doing. 
and congratulations. Thank you. Um, on our network, like the shows that you see online on our network are only a fraction of the shows that we produce because wow, okay. we don't put every show that we produce on our network. The majority of the shows that are on our network are Arizona based. That's why you're looking at it going, oh, this is Arizona. But the majority of shows that we produce are for different cities, like people that even have shows on traditional radio that just don't like the way that they cook the food in their local radio kitchen. Yeah. They want us to produce it better, and then they put it on local radio if they still believe in that. Or on other networks, if they like the way that we cook the food better, that we produce their shows, they have us produce the shows, and then they actually put it on like an LA talk radio or other networks, which is fine. We don't care. Right. Distribution is not where we make our money. Yeah, we have some advertisers on distribution just for some low-hanging fruit, but that's not what we really do. We produce shows. We consult shows. We try to elevate shows to the next level, and we do all the custom imaging for shows so they sound really good so they can go anywhere. So the majority of shows that you're seeing are Arizona shows. That's why it seems Arizona-based, oh, okay. but that's not really our bigger clientele. Probably... I don't know, 90% of our revenue is outside of Arizona with all the commercials we do, all the production we do. You're just seeing like a tiny segment well, I, I there. I can only do so much research, Dave. <laughs> but, one man crew, <laughs> but I'll tell okay? you, but, but, what you're, but what you're seeing, and I thank you for that, we're very proud of because I'm an Arizona guy. Yeah. So I'm really proud to have those shows on. And for those who really know Arizona, when you look at that network, uh, that you were looking at, you're going to see other Hall of Famers, longtime radio and television people, some of the real players in the community that we're very, very proud of. So I love that network, what you're talking about. But yeah, that's not the bigger model. You're kind of seeing the tip of the iceberg there. Okay. Because I'll tell you, I, for what I was able to go and look at and see about Star World One, the, the infrastructure, you, you got nice studios, you got a good setup. Everything is very well done. It's good, slick production. I, I like what you put together. I mean, you know, you're a radio guy. And the thing is, you know, it's funny how, and it's a good question for this. I, I wasn't thinking about this, but when you hear some of the podcasts that are out there, obviously, I mean, that is where the radio audience has gone. But, mm -hmm. you know, some of the grassroots radio people that are out there, they need a radio touch. Or there are those that have come in from radio to transfer, transition in that kind of just bring in the same format, but there were certain people that didn't figure out how they needed to go ahead and transition for this new audience because they don't want the same old, same old trust or radio sound. They don't want the commercials embedded. They want, you know, it's a, it's a very finicky audience. And I just think, what do you think about the fact that, you know, of what you had to change about what your, what your format, so I know you do have commercials that are embedded in some of your programming, so there's that, but it is interesting where, you know, the mindset of the podcast listener now. Yeah, and what you guys are doing, again, I, I give you credit for, because that's so needed right now in podcasting more than ever. So there are literally millions of podcasts in the world, but only a fraction of those are pro podcasts. The majority of those podcasts are just junk. They're on almost these platforms that are like leaving a voicemail. It's horrid. <laughs> but it's free and people gravitate towards free. Yeah. So in the old days when they would go to, you know, whatever it was, blog talk and they go, yeah, I'm getting it for free. Yeah. And it sounds like you're leaving a voicemail for oh. aunt Edna in Wisconsin, oh. you know, or they do Facebook live for more than 30 seconds or 60 seconds, which is what it was originally intended for. And they're trying to be the next Jimmy Fallon. They end up looking silly. Or if they just want to go the free route and they try to duct tape and chewing gum something together like MacGyver from their office or their basement like Wayne's World, they end up hurting their brand more than helping their brand. They look yeah. bad. But in their mind, hey, it's free. Not everything free is good. So what you and I do is we give them a professional presentation and some mm -hmm. consultation that elevates their brand. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the majority of podcasts that come our way, they are not revenue models. Some are, some aren't. Some want to profit off their podcast, which is awesome. Most don't. Most that come our way are branding their primary business. They're branding their sports team. They're branding their, right. their musical group. They're branding whatever they do, but it's branding. 
No, for uh, us, it's about so. it's lead generation. They want, and I always say it's a two pronged yeah. approach when I pitch. So it's about yep. getting leads from the listeners that are going to listen to your program, but also we will schedule book and prep the guests that will come on your show that you want to pitch afterwards. Yep. See, that's that's the way podcasts should be used. It's a niche market, but relationships are king. We have a luxury real estate agent in Arizona. They only sell million dollar houses or more. So their guests are only clients that either want to sell their property or want to have somebody buy their property. Well, after 30 minutes sitting in front of the host, the host now knows everything about them. They know how many bedrooms they want, how many bathrooms they want, how many square feet they want, what area of town they want to be in. And they close business right there on the spot because that guest is actually their target. Yeah. That's very smart. Uh, and then we put that together in the crock pot with these beautiful studios where they can take photos and scream on social networks. And oh, yeah. that's the whole advantage of pro podcasting. But again, the free thing, people love free. And if they feel like they can do it from home and get past the cost, they'll do it, although they sound like crap. No, and, and there's also those people that now, oh, look, I get a chance to be on radio. Yeah, okay, but then you see the, the, the cream rises at the top. <laughs> and uh, my, my thing is, there are certain radio people that made their way through. Adam Carolla was a great example. Well, that's successful. Yeah. Good for him. People that decided just like came into it overnight. The thing is, too, is I'll, I will say one thing, and I'm surprised there are not more people from podcasting that have made their way over to other mediums. Joe Rogan going from, you know, doing Fear Factor and doing stand-up, that show he does, I must admit, is so simple and there's no script you could tell. That guy's just off the cuff. It's so well done. I'm like, how? I mean, <laughs> what do you think about yeah, you know, so like that? Guys like Adam and Joe, I give them a ton of credit, but a big part of their credit is quite frankly just who they know. I mean, That's Adam true. was in Los Angeles. He cut his teeth with Jimmy Kimmel and those guys. His, I mean, his lanes to celebrities to have anybody on his show from the start to where it is now has always been available. Joe Rogan actually has had a very interesting career to where he's met a ton of people. And Joe Rogan can get guests that very few others can so yeah, a little bit of magic is in their personality. And I think yeah. both of them have good personalities and they're very good at what they do. But let's be honest, a lot of people listen for the guests that are on those shows. And that comes <laughs> yeah. again from relationships. It's not like Joe and Adam are far and above better personalities than others in the nation. They just work the system well and they've worked the relationships well. And you have to give them credit for that. And they stay in their lane. And Adam Crowell, another guy, another guy. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you, being first of all, being one of the scapegoats to Howard leaving, him and David Lee Roth. Look, I figured David Lee Roth was gonna crash and burn. I mean, I like him <laughs> as a musician, but Jesus Christ, that show was a train wreck. We and that's the problem. In West Palm, when they had Howard on a market here, they replaced him not with Adam, but with David Lee. I'm like, oh, that was horrible. Yeah. And Adam, to his credit, another guy with contract money after the fact said, okay, I'm going to start my podcast network. And he started to be the first and became the top guy immediately. And the, oh my God, I got 4 million listeners. And now everybody's like, oh, okay, podcasting means something. I tell this story all the time on this show. I called Don and Mike from Washington, D.C. at the time, and they still, right, right towards the end of their show right during when the day that Anna Nicole Smith died. And I remember calling in and trying to give some kind of constructive criticism. They got pissed. And then he asked me, what do I do for a living? Cause they could see how they thought I was some radio guy. I was like, yeah, I do podcasting. <laughs> and then I said, yeah, I do podcasting. I was like, Oh, so you're working at McDonald's, right? <laughs> Basically <laughs> they gave me that. And I was like, okay, okay. That's 2007, whatever. I get it. Fine. But you know, and look at where they are now. They're all like, you know, they try to go and still kind of keep that radio promise, whatever. But again, the same thing, but they struggle as well to try to keep the money that comes on board. But well, you, sc you scared them. You scared them because <laughs> through you, they saw the future and the same thing happened with me. Although I wasn't as early as you, yeah. um, but we scared them because they saw what was on their horizon. Just like if you look at times in history, <laughs> 1991, scared the hell out of television networks. Why? Because this upstart little company, a cable company called CNN, 
was bunkered in a hotel room in the Al Rashid Hotel on the ninth yeah. floor in Baghdad doing 24 hour coverage of Operation Desert Storm, and yeah. they couldn't. Right. They, that scared them because they went, oh my God, this is the future. This is what we're going to compete with. You did the same thing to Don and Mike. And yeah. eventually, they're all going to go internet because that's, that's just the way. We, we don't choose what people love to use in media. The people choose that. What we do is take our content and we put it where people can get it in the way that they want to receive it. And that's internet today. That's what it is. And what we're going through now with this coronavirus thing, internet's going to be bigger than ever because even when this virus is over, the culture is not going back in terms of media. Now telemedicine, telehealth, people know all about it now. Yeah. Um, people know about ordering online, groceries online, how easy it is to do takeout. People know about it now. You know, it used to be that people would ask the question, is there a reason that we need to meet online? You know, is there a reason that we can't meet in person? The next question is going to be, is there a reason that we need to meet in person? We can just do Zoom. Yeah. This is changing the entire culture. And they're saying that in the month of April, It'll be the highest used month in the history of the internet. Why? Because everybody's at home. They're quarantined. They're working from home. Yeah. More people are getting teachers who never really use the internet now have to learn how to teach their students digitally or they don't have a job. This is not going to go I'll back. You, the internet is going to be bigger people... than ever. What is going to be uh, interesting is that it, 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 it's a great way to put it. This is another technological disruption, except this is a societal disrupt, disruption. Not like we see with media, but this, I think there are going to be some advantages to it. I think some of the cream of the crop will rise at the top. And I think some people that were kind of, you know, not equipped to go ahead. And I think, you know, there will be some antiquation that'll come in. So some people that are not able to survive this portion of this disruption, it's going to change things. And I think, but one thing I think there, there'll still be things for society to have, like people will still have reasons to go out. The movies will come back. Concerts will come back. Dating will come back. Like there'll be restaurants will be a thing again. Yep. Like people are going to want to go back out again, but it will sure. be, it'll be second guess now. Yeah. When it comes to media is what I'm talking about. I think the culture is going to be changed <clears throat> forever. You know, when you talk about when you made the decision to go digital, I'll never forget this. In the fall of 2010, when I made the announcement that I was going to go off old school traditional media and start a digital network, a local paper here had my ugly mug on the front when papers were still being out on the front. And it said, what do Dave Pratt and 2010 have in common? And the punchline was, they'll both be gone by 2011. Wow. And the writer of that paper is now gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's 10 years later. Almost everybody in the local radio and television industry is gone or pay cut or looking for jobs. It just takes time. And that's what happens to all early believers. That's what oh, happened with you, with Don and, and Mike. Dave, you are groveling now. Oh my God. Bob yeah. Pittman last year. Okay, I have had a firestorm against Bob Pittman, the CEO of iHeartMedia. First of all, I just, I mean, I worked for Clear Channel for four years. And some great people that I've got to work with behind the scenes. But that corporate model is horrible. Horrible. And the fact that they have now infiltrated podcasting. Oh, we're going to, I don't mind NPR being in the space because they do good content. I really don't mind them at all. It's a different style. I actually, I prefer if NPR would just unload the radio stations. And just stick to podcasting. I think it just I think it would make more money, honestly. I think it would just do better anyway than people sticking to a schedule. Everybody knows we like it, we like our, our content on demand now. And then the thing too is um oh lost my thought. Oh my god, what am I thinking here? The so when I look at where was I at just now? No worries. <laughs> I'm trying to think you're of talking about Bob Pittman. 
And oh, yeah, Bob, you, okay. Why, so Bob Pittman talking about podcasting as radio's birthright. So all of a sudden, oh, look at this change around. Like, he can't succeed in the revenue models he has. That Honestly, if I had the opportunity, I think I could do a little bit more with, you know, don't split your internet and uh, your internet radio stream and your terrestrial stream as two separate pipelines. Why don't you bundle and package your deals for advertising? You fool. Then coming into this space and being asked at podcast conventions, I actually talked to the podcast with one of the uh, people that co-founder. I was like, you know, come on, you brought Bob Pittman on. I mean, it's kind of talking like he's like the new sage of podcasting. I'm like, no, I want I want some of this corporatization to stay out of my podcasting. Please get out of here. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was up at the NAB and I was doing some side stuff, some presentations and stuff. Not at the NAB, just to piss them off. I would do it at my own locations, but everybody was in town, so they could come over and see it, right? And it was on new media. Yeah. And some people from iHeart were there, some big managers from iHeart, and they made the point that radio will always be around because it's more convenient. It's what people love the most. And I yeah. said, look, um, we're going to make this really easy. <laughs> What's the name of your company? And they said, iHeart. And I said, right. And the I is like a small I. Yeah. And they go, yeah. And I go, what does that stand for? <laughs> I said, I think the game's over. And I said, did you bring your radio in with you? I said, right now, just let me hear it. And I said, does anybody here have a cell phone on them? And you could hear it in the room. <laughs> Go up. And I said, you understand that the only chance of people listening to your radio station is through the internet, which is hilarious. Yeah. You are now subservient to us. And they yes. hated that. They they just absolutely hated that. But what happened is when you have iHeart or Clear Channel or whatever with a thousand radio stations, it's almost like a short sale for homes. <laughs> they can't short sale every property. They can't sell them for what they bought them for. No. So they would have to short sell them. Now, you might be able to do that once with your house, but you can't do that a thousand times with radio stations and take the hit, especially when you're already billions in debt. You, no, you can't sell do your it. towers to lease them. I'm like some of the the, the thought process of these companies, it, oh. and the private equity has not helped at all. Like you know, I'm still surprised oh. this company goes into bankruptcy, twenty billion in the hole. They still get to operate at six uh, at a five point seven billion dollar hit. I'm like, there is no way that IPO is going to come back on, to get them back up. They're still running the and their only of- reason for operating is to pay their interest. <laughs> I mean, that's it. I would never want to be yeah. on a drowning ship like that. That's amazing. Oh, have, oh so many good pro. There's so, so many good properties right there too. I wish I had one of those stations to operate myself. I would. I would be one of those people that are still stubborn enough to try that again. <laughs> if I could run it, I would want to do it and see what I could do. But you know, I know it's you know what I think is going to happen in the future. I I think in the future. Now, this is down the road, and some people laugh at me when I say this, but in the future, what's going to happen with radio is you're going to get a full branding and lead generation play. So it's going to all reverse. So you're going to go to an FM station that's owned by Ford Motor Company. And then you're going to go to one that's owned by Amazon, talking about their new products. And it's all going to be branded and lead generation. Interesting. And it's going to be specifically for people that get in a car, because anymore, <laughs> the only place yeah. you're going to listen to radio and they're going to wipe out those commercials. I got to tell you, the other day, I go out in the garage during this quarantine thing and I'm yeah. always out and active and at the gym and I try to find different ways to exercise and stuff. I go out in the garage and this was almost like it could have been a commercial for the internet because I saw this radio sitting in the corner and I was getting on my, my old man treadmill <laughs> and I thought, you know what? What the heck? I haven't listened to radio forever. I'm just going to try it. <laughs> and I put 30 minutes on the treadmill for my timer. Yeah. And I listen to radio. And I, I'm trying to find music that I like. And then I leave the radio. I get on my treadmill. About six minutes into my workout, they go to a commercial break. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. Ten minutes. Oh. Ten minutes while I'm trying to make it through on the treadmill and I need music to keep me going. They come back and they play like, Two songs, you know, eight minutes. Again, 10-minute commercial. I'm on this treadmill going, 
I can't get motivated listening to a Geico c- commercial. I can't do it. No, I, no. It, it's horrible. So I will never turn that radio on again to work out. I'll make sure that my iPod's charged <laughs> because yeah. it's just so old. It's such an old model. And I, and, and I also take credence to the people that were programming back like in the 50s and 60s when they had jingles and they had ways to entertain you throughout, even if you were in the middle of an ad break. Like just the way that it was a personality, the way they can just keep things through. When I listen to like an old WABC air check, the way that just kept flowed across. I'm like, damn, you really had to do, like you had to put on point everything you're doing and make it as entertaining as possible across the board without making anybody lose uh, to, to not have that time spent listening drop to not let that cue drop. It's like incredible. I want to ask and you some how, of these programmers, okay. some of these programmers, they like you mentioned Lee, who by the way is a very nice man. You probably know him. Um, I, I disagree with some of the stuff um, that, he has to say, but that's fine. But he's always been very nice. Yeah. John Sebastian, um, those guys, John's a friend, you know, he lives here. Um, but they still keep thinking that they're going to develop the next big radio format. And I'm like, guys, it's old technology. That's like saying, we're going to come out with a great VHS movie that we're going to sell a blockbuster. The reason Blockbuster died isn't because the movies weren't good. It's because the technology was old. Nobody has VCRs and VHS tapes. Right. You have to go to a different format. There's a reason Netflix is number one today, and they refuse to get off the dime. They're still driving that 1971 Gremlin. And I'm like, guys, no. You, <laughs> you know, I understand you're smart guys. Figure out something smart to do on the Internet. You have to let it go. It's gone. Yeah. It's sports authority. It's a beeper. It's a payphone. They're <laughs> gone, guys. You know, you might as well be wearing your members only jacket from Chess King. It's gone. Oh, Those days man. are gone. <laughs> Good you job. know, but but wait, like, authority guys, magazine quoted you, and I want to take this quote because you're talking just about this exact same thing. It says, "When trends you have seen it in your industry, you told them." Technology, technology, technology. There's a reason why Blockbuster Video is closed. Time moves on and <laughs> yeah, technology right. moves forward. AM, FM is old and dusty. Yep. It's taking over mass media, and just like it's taking over shopping with Amazon, television with Netflix, it's the same for radio, TV, and all types of mass media. Internet rules. Well said. So I'll, I'll tell you something funny. My daughter, um, who's you know 18 years old, she wasn't around when I was really doing radio at a high level and stuff. I mean, she was too young to remember that. And she said, dad, would you do me a favor? And I said, what? And she goes, can we go to the hall of fame museum? And I said, Oh God, honey, I go there. I feel like I'm dead. She goes, why? I said, because they got mannequins with my old band stage show outfits on them. I feel like I died. I feel like I'm looking at myself in a museum. (laughs) She goes, please take me. So I took her right. Yeah. And you'll love this story an eight track tape was one of the displays. And she said, what was that? And I tried to explain it to her. And I told her, I said, in the, in the middle of your favorite song, you might hear a track switch. Ka-ching. She goes, this is what you listen to dad. I said, honey, when I, was, when I was in high school, we had eight track tape players in our cars. And she goes, those big things. I go, yeah, we would shove them into the dashboard. <laughs> I'm trying to explain this to her, right? I'm trying to explain this to her. Oh man. Well, like, here's the problem with here's yeah. the problem with radio today. If she could have reached down and grabbed that A track, that's fine. She could look at it, but there's no place to play it. No. Because the technology's old. And that's what radio just won't accept. It's old. You know, there's better ways to listen to content. And they just can't accept that. When you look at evolution, you know, from AM to FM, at first, I mean, you know the history of radio. AM stations hated that. They wouldn't accept it. And then all of a sudden, FM comes around. And the same thing with cable television. Everybody laughed at this Ted Turner guy saying, there's no way people are going to do cable. What do you mean? And now look. And then Netflix, everybody, it's just... Technology, 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 everything evolves and the people that are afraid to accept it or afraid of the competition that it's going to bring instead of evolving themselves, then they're going to be left behind. And I think a lot of that comes with age. 
you know, we're comfortable with what we grew up on. And some don't want to get off that dime to start a digital network. Quite honestly, I really had to humble myself after, you know, any level of success that I was lucky enough to, to gain over the years. I had to humble myself and learn from people that hadn't been in the business, you know, more than a couple of years because I wanted to learn new media. But at some point you either have to evolve or just call it good adapt or die as billy bean would say a money ball adapt or die right and the thing too it's also much easier to go ahead and be able to adapt if you get in an early adopt early enough because to do it now so late in the game for some people to hear now oh i'm gonna start a podcast i mean oh boy don't do it i mean just you can just tell people that just <laughs> have not really been adapting to the model at all probably not consuming it so much they think you just jump right in and like okay you know it, it just doesn't did you ever see um did you see the movie Moneyball? I did. Loved it. The best scene in that whole movie to relate to what you and I are discussing today is when Billy Bean is meeting with the owner of the Boston Red Sox. Mm-hmm. And the Boston Red Sox um, owner is ready to give Billy Bean the offer. And he says, Billy, anybody who disrupts the system, people don't like it. Yeah. People don't like anybody who's going to do something different than what they're comfortable with. Because it scares them. It makes them afraid. It changes their world. That's the same thing with what we're doing now. Same thing. And you and there I are, are no more disruptors. Like, I mean, the, the technology is disrupting. But what about the people that used to really disrupt and shake things up? There's this political correctness, this whole field where nobody's allowed to get, like, out there and, you know, take some, take some, uh, take some stabs of the knife. Like, go out there and be subjected to ridicule and just... Who cares? Just go for they it. They won't do it. You know, Entercom just did a big round of layoffs. We have Entercom here in Phoenix. Yeah. And a number of those personalities called me and they said, Dave, we heard that you're, you're doubling and tripling staff during this coronavirus. And I said, that's true, but let me explain that to you. Yeah. We're doubling the IT side of our staff. Yes. To set up these big healthcare companies with telemedicine, telehealth, and we're getting digital messaging out. But what they were calling for is they wanted to know if we had a job that would give them a two week paycheck for talking in a mic. <laughs> no, it's 2020. It's 2020. So I said to one of them who's a friend, and I didn't want to make them feel bad, especially during this time, but I said, How are you going to make me money by talking in a mic? How? Do you sell? Do you do IT? Can you go to a healthcare group, a hospital, and set them up on Zoom and show the doctors how to use it? How are you going to make me money by talking in a mic? You might as well just work for voiceover work. That's about it. Voiceover work, or we do audio books, but a lot of times the authors want to do the audio books themselves. Yeah. But I keep trying to tell them that day has passed. Nobody's just going to give you a two week paycheck for doing nothing. You're, you're going to have to do something that makes a company money. <laughs> and there's so many uh, different things that, that technology can do that they don't need manpower for anymore. Exactly. You got it. And, and that's why we morphed what you and I do. I love, and believe me, you and I could get together and, and we could probably just talk about glory days of radio and laugh our butt off together because you and I love it that much. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you and I don't love what was, but oh, you yeah. and I are both looking at what is going to be. People today, they can't get out of that. They can't get out of that system. They're still waiting for the two week paycheck doing exactly what they've done. That's why we morphed our company for times like this, like with coronavirus. Because if one thing starts to fall, we have the IT and the internet side to lift it up on the other side. It's all oh, about our balance. Business is, we, got, we, we, have, we have room for more work. I mean, I'm, I'm as yes. busy as I've ever been right now. Right. I know we're going to get some more right. business. I'm, we're going to get more clients right now as a result because they're all. And, you know, it was only until last year we thought about we wanted to try the virtual conference thing. My boss, you know, originally, he's a bit of an entrepreneur. And he has tried some things where, you know, a little bit ahead of time and that's okay. But 
now we're thinking about virtual conferences again, and we were thinking about this October last year. Now is the best possible time to do it. And we already have the infrastructure. We already have scheduled two shows. That right there yeah. is going to, I mean, it's unfortunate why it's happening like this, but we're going to luck out, I think, in the end. Absolutely. I really need to research more about what you guys do because oh, we're gonna talk I offline. always believe in. We've got to talk more about what we're doing here because there might be some stuff we could do together. I really believe there's, there's that, something about that. I always look for alliances and there might be some cool stuff that we can send your way and vice versa, but I always look for alliances. So I'm really glad that we got together. Oh, I'll introduce you to the bosses. We can have a nice little chat. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you a few more things before I wrap things up. Cause I mean, you've actually been answering a lot of questions before I even ask him. You've been proactive about that. That's been great. We talked about Lee Abrams and there is one quote mm -hmm. I want to bring off of him where he did a Facebook rant and he's been a little more active talking on, on online. And I can appreciate where he's coming from. At least he's being a little more realistic now. He did say recently, quote, radio is in an undeniable position of strength in terms of accessibility. But as a fan of the medium, it has the potential for long-term extinction in its current form. When you hear that phrase, what do you think? So it's like, you know, there's the, I guess maybe he doesn't see where the, I don't know where the strength is anymore. I mean, the access is there. It would be, you would think there's got to be some way to make people just take Every car still has a radio in it. Maybe you can still find a reason to make them turn it on. Yeah, so I give Lee credit for that because I think that that was a very smart statement. So the next yeah. challenge of radio does want to survive is what are they going to do with it? I think the first thing they have to do is going to scare the hell out of them. They absolutely have to get rid of recorded commercials because, oh yeah, you know, anybody can get any kind of media they want at – you know, the stroke of a smartphone at a stroke of a keyboard. They can skip through commercials. When you go to a video that you want to see and it says, skip this ad in three seconds to you, that's an eternity. Imagine waiting through eight to 10 minutes of a commercial break to hear the next content. And imagine being the advertiser that's in the seventh or eighth or ninth spot in that commercial break. What's that worth? Problem is some even ad agencies haven't wised up. They still don't see it. They're just taking their little commission checks, still selling the same thing and not paying attention. It'll take smart clients to make them change their ways. I would never buy a seventh, eighth or ninth position commercial on a radio station for any reason because people are gone by that time. So what Lee is saying is so true. Radio has to figure out if it has any chance of surviving, how it's going to be viable. The first thing is they're going to have to take away commercials, recorded commercials. Now they can do integrated mentions, maybe um, personalities talking about products they like, about how much they like Amazon during this coronavirus or UPS or whatever they want to do, but they're going to have to integrate that somehow. And they're going to have to find a way to up their talent level instead of just, you know, downsizing, downsizing, pay cuts, pay cuts, pay cuts, and just hiring the first kid out of college that'll sit in the chair and work the shift or that can automate a station for 18 hours. Or let's be honest, and, the ones that have gone to broadcasting school that have a deal with the radio network that they're already getting a kickback for bringing the kid on board. Exactly. That happens. Oh my God. That happens so yeah. many times. Thank you. They're going to have to get by that and they're going to have to start respecting their listeners again. Yeah. Thinking what do they really want? What can we give them that they really need? But having said that, I'm still not a believer that it can survive, not, not as a major player. I just but think it's over. I want to ask this question because now we're in this, this coronavirus situation. We see what economically, okay, not just Intercom, iHeartMedia also furloughed. Bob Pittman is, is foregoing his salary, but of course, that doesn't mean his bonus isn't going to go away, right? Hey, come on, come on. You don't <laughs> That's think just it's hilarious when I read that. Even David Field, even, told, even David Feld is like, oh no, I'm only going to cut thirty percent of my pay. No, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Come on, you guys! I was I laughing you so jerks, hard when man. I read that. Oh God! <laughs> you read the uh, wall. But here's the thing: this, I think, not only is it a disruption, I think there's a disruption for Trust for Radio on its way because these companies, if they're going to be like they are now, there's nothing left to cut. They're going to have to unload. These these companies are going to go bankrupt now because they had no kind of revenue to uh, hold up for a rainy day. They're all going to fail. And what I think is they let them fail and they fire sale all their stations to local programmers that have money to do something with it. 
Do you see that happening? And if it does, then do you see where there's a change to the model? Maybe people will say, okay, we need to cut the commercials down. We need to cut all out, no more commercials, period, and come in. Because I've, I've talked to some of the radio people that have been around in radio for a long time, and they're always going to be like, I'm t- oh, if I talked to my friend Ray, man, who worked uh, as a you know, mixed DJ for a bunch of different stations. He worked in Orlando, Miami, and uh, he says, you tell me how you make it work, I'll come back and do it. But if, until then, radio's not going to change. You need to get rid of the ads. you got to get rid of them. You got to yeah, change everything. I think we're going to see radio shift more and more, even more so towards digital. Like right now, we cannot listen to a radio station or watch a television station. And I know this because I just finished consulting one of the biggest groups in the nation without every single on air talent saying, follow us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, check us out on Instagram, go to our website. Every single one can't say that enough. Next time you watch television uh, news or you, it'll be a, a, a crawler underneath the on-air talent will say it radio over and over and over and over Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, link, whatever it is, that's all they're promoting. And that's really what iHeart did leaving clear channel as they said they even changed the name of their company what we talked about to iheart then they tried doing music festivals and now they're trying podcasts and their iheart app and all this kind of stuff well they're doing that to make up for all the losses on their radio side so what we're going to see is we're just going to see more and more and more of that with these radio companies trying to at least you know put a finger in the dam by getting money and revenue off digital that's saw, one way they're going to go. I think the funniest thing the, last year, the one of the funniest things I ever laughed at was when iHeart took a station, I think it was Western Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, and took over podcast content to create a podcast only format. <laughs> that is the funniest <laughs> shit I ever heard. Like these people are, are so out of touch. I want the radio business to kind of just get a full shakeup. And I think this right situation, how unfortunate it is for all the radio brethren we have out there that are out of work. I'm so sorry for you guys. But I think this will be good if there's if Trust for Radio has a life after this. Because obviously if they don't, you know, digital's doing we're doing just fine on the digital side. Yeah, and for those, and I, I agree with you. I feel sorry for them too because I have many friends, but wake up. Come on, <laughs> try to morph, try to evolve. You know, it used to be that radio stations would just give added value to their advertisers on their website. Hey, thanks for advertising on our radio station. We're going to give you a free banner on our website. Now it's opposite. Hey, thanks for being on our website and socials. We're going to give you some free commercials on our radio station. Everything is flipped. Everything is flipped. Oh, we and don't the do people that realize that. We don't even bother. It's, like, it's just a gimme now. You're right. When we get, and, and I want to be careful because I'm very grateful for the production assignments that we get, but we get national concerts. We get national casinos wanting us to make commercials for their radio stations across the country. And of course, we do that. Yeah. But the more that I talk to them, they're telling us the reason that they still advertise on radio is it's mice nuts. It's pennies compared to what it used to be. And in a lot of really small towns, don't ask me why, but small towns that have grown up on radio carrying high school football games on Friday nights, yep. it's still somewhat prevalent in the older demos. So that's where these commercials are coming from. But I really see the whole recorded commercial thing going away soon. Um, And I think you and I are in the right lane. I love what you and I are doing. I think it's great. (laughs) I wish everybody would figure it out, man. It's just, um, but I'm happy. Hey, I'm sure we're happy. If anybody has a little bit of money to to put together, even here or after, uh, I'm sure your company or mine will go ahead and take on clients. Hey, we'll help you build radio. We know what to do. We'll, we'll make it for you. We know what to do. Absolutely. We'll turn you into radio people. You know I mean? And hey, on a fun side, just being a, a radio junkie, um, you know, starting when I started in radio and, and just loving what used to be a true art form, on a fun side, not a business side, if you get a chance, uh, 
go, go to my socials. We're doing a segment called more than a song during this quarantine. And I promise it will make you laugh. It'll make you laugh. So if you go to Dave Pratt live on whatever Facebook, and I'm not doing this to promote, I'm doing this to make you laugh Yeah, and give you, give you some smiles during this crazy time. It's called more than a song. And what I'm doing is I'm choosing 50 songs in my career that mean something to me and why. Yeah. So a lot of it really brings up a ton of humor. Like when I got kicked off the air with George Carlin, that's in there. (laughs) Um, And you can read some of these memories that will just give you a smile during this crazy time. It's not monetized. It's nothing about that. It's just fun. And I think you'll love it. So if we're looking for that, Facebook or Twitter, Dave Pratt Live, P-R-A-T-T, one word. And then again, the book I got to make mention of again, it's uh, Behind the Mic, 30 Years in Radio. I got to go look for it. I'm going to go find it on Audible to listen to it. You did voice it, right? Uh, It starts May 11th. So we're voicing it now. And it it will be released chapter by chapter for free starting on May 11th. And it'll have a full update to it. So the original book sold out at um, Barnes and Noble and Borders, Amazon once in a while you can find a copy. Yeah. But keep in mind that was a while ago. That, that was 12 years ago. Oh, yeah. So now we're doing an update with everything we've done since. And we release it chapter by chapter on May 11th, absolutely free. And I hope it gives everybody some smiles and some good memories. Fantastic. Hey, Morning Mayor Dave Pratt, again, and StarWorldWideNetworks.com is where you can find all the work that you're doing loads of different things you could do again all digital services audio video commercial production content for social networks advertising media buying get your own show on there dave pratt thanks for being on the show i really appreciate it thank you and let's keep in touch okay